wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace. Thank you so much. You guys are doing the second service too? So I get to hear that again? That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. What a, what a wonderful gift. Hear the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. 
And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. When I was preparing, well, first of all, um, I had meant to say this at the beginning, but I got more flustered than I expected at the beginning. So first, I want to thank all of you uh, for your generous welcome. I want to thank those who have been working so hard and so tirelessly on the trustees uh, to do so much in the parsonage to get things ready for us. I want to thank, when we, when we first moved in, we, we found several gift baskets uh, that were uh, there in the, in the kitchen, and, and what an what a incredible blessing. And others of you have, have offered some gifts during the week, and, and we're, we're so thankful uh, for the way that, that you've welcomed us. And uh, now as we, as we come to hear God's word, I, the sermon I'm about to preach is not a fill-in-the-blank kind of sermon. <laughs> I, I think that would... Uh, uh, probably distract you more than, more than help you, uh, because I, there's, there are some sermons that are more information, and this is one that's more proclamation. It's more one to be experienced than to try to, to travel along with, if that makes sense. So instead of offering notes for you to fill in as, as I go along, uh, I offered some reflection questions uh, to, uh, to maybe take with you during the week. We might look at these on Wednesday at Bible study uh, and to, to think about some of these things more. Um, so it's a little different, but I think as... as we begin to hear God's word together, you'll, you'll understand. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to listen to what you would speak and what you would proclaim this day, Lord, let our hearts be ready to hear all that you want to say, not necessarily what I'm going to say, but what you would speak to each of our hearts and make us, enliven us by your spirit, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder what creation was thinking that day. There was a breathless silence, a stillness throughout the universe. The newly formed lions and donkeys and turtles and caterpillars were standing quietly among the trees, watching. The birds flew slowly by, listening, and the fish stuck their heads out of the water to see what would happen. Even the stars paused in their cosmic dance for just a moment, their attention focused in. God was finished. The creative act was done, and God was speaking words echoing through the young world. Words of blessing and announcing and ordaining. Be fruitful and multiply. God said to them, to the two who were standing there, Fill the earth and subdue it. Creation inhaled a moment, expectantly. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. There was a hush. And then the noise of approval. A rumble grew into a roar as all creation greeted these humankind, their new queen and king. The applause resounded all around. Hundreds and thousands and millions of snouts and beaks and trunks and branches and leaves raised an acclaim for the male and female that stood regally in their midst. Creation had not chosen these rulers, but creation accepted them. Creation had not chosen this dominion, but the creator willed it 
in hope. Creation stood ready to receive its rulers, these humankind, these bearers of the image and likeness of God. By the will of the Creator, creation was made subject. And God saw everything that He had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. But there was one tiny detail. Would this male and female act as king and queen? Would these rulers of creation, these bearers of the image and likeness of God, would they accept their calling? Would they rule this new world justly and lovingly in grace and truth? Would they rule as God would rule? Mirrors reflecting the image of God. Would they accept God's charge to rule and to subdue? Because there it was. There it stood before them. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A tree that they were given charge over a fruit that they were called to subdue. And there it was, the serpent, the craftiest of the animals that the Lord God had made, a serpent that they were given charge over, a serpent that they were called to subdue, a serpent that they were supposed to rule. It was all good. It was all very good if they stepped up to the plate, if they ruled, if they subdued, if they lived out this covenant that was given by their creator. But as they listened to the serpent, as they looked at the fruit, as they pondered the possibilities, desires awoke within them. Desires grew within them. Desires to taste, to chew, to eat. Desires to have, to take, to hold. They were good desires if they were ruled, if they were subdued, if they were channeled correctly. Would they rule? Would they subdue? Would they step up to the plate? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They didn't rule. They didn't subdue. Desires surged, and they were the ones who were ruled. Desires surged, and they were the ones who were subdued. The fruit looked so good. The serpent seemed so wise. The desires seemed so right. And they forsook the charge of the Creator. They were ruled by their created desires. They were subdued by their whims. They chose their own desires over covenant with God. And creation lost its queen and king that day. As the king and queen fell, as the image of God in them was broken, was tarnished, was covered with mud, they pulled their kingdom into corruption after them. And creation, that very good creation, was subjected to futility, frustration, vanity. And creation was enslaved to corruption. And creation groaned and cried out for freedom. And the creator, the one who had subjected it, the one who had entrusted it to that man and woman, the one who in hope had charged it to them, The Creator wept. The Creator watched as that serpent 
And the devil behind it laughed with glee, danced with glee, danced all over that now corrupted creation taking charge. Because the man and the woman had given up their charge. They had chosen to be ruled rather than rulers, to be subdued rather than subduers. They threw away their crowns, and the devilish serpent scooped them up. And 1 John 5, 19 tells us the whole world lies in the evil one. He's the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians says, for good reason. The serpent picked up their crowns and placed them on its own head. And he went out to play, forming hurricanes and earthquakes, lightning that killed Job's servants, and windstorms that killed Job's children, and famines and tsunamis and the chaos of the sea. Meanwhile, those fallen humans beget more fallen humans who beget more fallen humans who beget more fallen humans, a race of them, a whole human race of fallen, corrupted, broken human beings. And though they knew God, they did not glorify God as God, nor give thanks, but they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for idols, for images of human beings and birds and beasts and reptiles. They had chosen to be ruled by creation, and now they chose to worship creation. They had been made in God's image, but now they made things in their own corrupted image, in the images of this creation that they worshipped, this creation that they had corrupted. And creation groaned and cried out, and the serpent laughed, and the creator was grieved. But he still hoped. He still hoped. And when the fullness of time came, the Son, the image of the invisible God, took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. The human God grew and matured, and people thought maybe, just maybe, they glimpsed again what the image of God really looks like because they still had it somewhere, though it was buried beneath the mud and the corruption and the years of bondage to the serpent. And Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And the rocks wanted to cry out because they felt their ruler treading upon them once more. Their real ruler, not that serpent, not that usurper. The fig tree recognized too late the command of its master and not producing figs withered in shame. The fish rejoiced, leaping gladly into the nets of those fishermen of Peter and John because they recognized him and they were grateful to obey his call, grateful to be ruled once more, grateful that a new regent had come. And the donkey came and the coats were placed upon her back. And she practically shook with wonder during that fateful ride to Jerusalem amidst those waving palm branches bearing her king. And so it was during that long dark night as the serpent threw a storm against the disciples' boat that the surging sea let him pass. So it was as the new Adam, the true human, walked that the sea upheld him. Creation was waiting, watching, wondering if the vanity would end soon. Jesus trod upon the waters, subduing them under him, ruling them, reminding them of their true master. He walked confidently, steadily, uprightly, because he was not only the true human, but the creator as well. And the Lord, Yahweh, can still the waves and tread upon the waters, even when the serpent thinks that he owns them. The Lord had tread those waters through the Red Sea and was treading them again. And the seas rejoiced 
and the winds shrieked with laughter that the image of God was again ruling and subduing them. But we, we the corrupted ones, ruled by our passions and lusts, subdued by that serpent, we the tarnished ones, we who were born to even Adam, we resented this second Adam. We arrested him and flogged him and denied him and finally lifted him upon a cross to crucify him. And creation groaned and the sky grew dark as their savior, their true ruler, hung upon that cross. The serpent cackled with laughter, pulling his puppet strings that made Judas and Pilate and Herod leap and kill. The first Adam and Eve had given in to their desires, had given in to their lusts for the forbidden fruit of the forbidden tree. But Jesus, the second Adam, had subdued his passions and desires even unto death. Not my will, but your will, thine be done. And now Jesus died on another tree. Now he died, lifted high above the good earth. Now he died, hung on a tree and cut off from the holy land. His blood poured out upon the ground, spilled out upon the ground. It soaked the ground and the ground cried for justice, groaned for justice, assailed the courts of heaven for justice on this innocent blood. Ever since Cain killed Abel, the ground had groaned for the blood of sinful humans. Now that truly innocent blood was shed, the ground shook with anger, rumbled with anger, groaned for justice. And heaven, heaven smiled slyly because justice was the whole point. Heaven whispered the secret to the blood-soaked ground. And the ground listened in wonder and disbelief, in wonder and amazement, in wonder and relief. The ground slowly began to shake as the joke sunk deep and the mirth rose up and then the ground shook more and more and more and more and the tombs of the righteous ones began to crack, Matthew says. And then the ground shook with full-bodied, hearty belly laughs that rolled the stone away and sent the soldiers running in fear as Jesus strode forth from the tomb, alive and well, alive and transformed, alive with the light and the glory and the radiance of God, the renewed humanity, the ruler and subduer of the earth once more. The serpent had reached too far. The, root, the ground could not hold that innocent blood. Earth could not hold its righteous ruler. Death could not hold the God of life. Creation could not entomb its creator. The serpent was astonished and cried out in anguish, but determined to keep his rule as long as possible. And so creation still groans, but now in anticipation. Creation still groans, but now in hope. The sons and the daughters of God will be revealed. Jesus, the God-human, was the firstborn of a whole family, the first fruits of the resurrection, the new Adam begetting by the Spirit a new race of humanity, of every people and tribe and tongue and nation, showing once more the image of God and ruling once more instead of being ruled. God had subjected creation in hope, and God does not hope in vain. The creator himself entered creation 
to bring about that hope, to bring it to pass, to make all things new. And creation still groans, and the serpent still rampages, and the devastation of hurricanes and earthquakes remind us that creation is not yet renewed. But it will be. It will be. And all will be well. All will be well. All manner of things will be well in that day when every enemy is subdued and death is destroyed and God forever and ever is all in all. I offer these words in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, you are so good. Your love for us is so great. You would not leave us in our sins. You would not leave our broken world in its brokenness, but you have been at work to renew it ever since our ancestors fell. And we today pray that you would renew in us all that you would desire to renew. As we meet you at your table, would you encounter us here? In Jesus' name, amen.